Okay, hello everyone. My name is Chris Sankaran. I'm going to be presenting a tutorial on selective inference for computational genomics. If you want to follow along the slides, you can check out this link. If you want to see, I have some code demo, and all the figures that I include, you can generate it yourself. You just follow that link and have all So what is my intent for this talk? Uh, I'm hoping that it can be a little bit of a bridge between the kinds of multiple testing methods you might hear about in a class. So if you've heard about von Ferroni, you've heard about Benjamin Hoffman procedure, those sort of methods as a starting point, and bring it up to some of the, the main ideas that appear in some of the selective inference literature today. So structured as learning objectives again, the first two are kind of the foundational ideas in selective inference and multiple testing. And the last two, I think of as, they're going to be little vignettes. So the, what they are is, a, the third one is how to use contextual information to improve our multiple testing performance. And then the very last one is how to diagnose miscalibration, uh, use symmetry and address miscalibration. And so those two ideas, they're gonna appear as little vignettes. And uh, even though they're not gonna be at the level of what a lot of published work in selective inference are about, I hope they give you the kernel of the idea so that if you do see those kind of papers, you might be able to easily parse them and apply them to your own problems. So and I've liked how interactive the sessions have been all morning. Just pause, if you ask questions, I'm happy to discuss it. Okay, so just establishing some notation, what is the problem that we're trying to work on? So, the abstraction multiple testing problem is you have n different hypotheses, so you can think of this as n different genes. Some of them are null, some of them are non null. So the null hypothesis, maybe these are genes that are not associated with your disease of interest. The non null ones, there is some difference in the expression of the set for that disease of interest. You will have p values 1 through n corresponding to each of those hypotheses, and kind of the key quantity in a lot of this analysis something called the false discovery rate. So imagine any procedure, you're trying to figure out which of these M hypotheses are non-known. You're gonna identify some of them. Those that you flag for rejection are gonna be this denominator. But then you're always gonna have some sort of false positives, or false discoveries. That's this new thing. And what you want any method to, to guarantee is you search through all these m different hypotheses. You're going to have some procedure. You want to reject as many non-null as you can, while making sure that some fraction of them, or like, you can control the fraction of false positives. So that's kind of the, the correct quantity in this field to try to control. So this appears in many places. My main area is working in the microbiome. So in this context. People do a lot of studies where they associate the abundance of different species with some phenotype of interest. So people working on the gut-brain axis might be trying to say maybe which, which species abundances are related to people with depression, which are related to autism. These kinds of things have been established. But it's the same setup. You have many, many hypotheses, many different associations to search through. Most of them are probably not a true association. Some of them are in what I don't know. Okay. Kind of the, the very uh, essential quantity that you might want to plot once you have this problem is a p-value histogram. Right, so just take all the m p-values you have from your original, original tests, turn them into a histogram. It will often look like this, or you want it to look like this. The reason that you want it is like this is because most of your hypothesis is probably null, and under the null, the, they should be uniformly distributed. And that's what this large bulk is about. What is this spike here? These are where all the non-null hypotheses are living. And if it's non-null, you expect a very small p-value. So they all be kind of clustered in this first thing, the first couple of things. So you're already getting some interesting information by making this histogram. One reason, so this comes from a little simulation. I just do a little two sample testing problem, done t-test a lot. I know which ones are null, which ones are non-null. 
I've colored in the Mano are red. So there are a few that are actually a little bit larger, still out there. And the null, these are the blue. So we're following roughly uniform distribution. And just maybe this histogram gives you a lot of information because the size of the spike, right? If the spike is actually not coming out very far from this blue bulk, then that tells you something that you actually have fewer non-null in general across the entire population. So this is something just directly making this plot can tell you kind of how enriched are you for non-nulls. Okay. So one, already one reason to plot this. Okay. One very useful recipe that will control the false discovery rate in the setting is called the Benjamin Hopkins procedure. So just get everyone on the same page. The way this works, you sort your m p values, 1 through m, that's where parenthesis is the ordering. And starting from the first, you compare it to a sequence of thresholds. So the first threshold is the most stringent. You have your false discovery rate that you want to control, so q you imagine could be like 0.1, 10% false discoveries at most. Then you divide it by the number of hypotheses. So at that first one, it's almost like Montferroni. But then unlike Montferroni, the next p-value, you are allowed to be a little bit more relaxed. So instead of q divided by m, it's 2 times q. And you continue to relax the sequence of thresholds, so you're not asking. And it turns out that if you follow this procedure and reject the final one, which is still below the sequence of thresholds, that will control the false system. Okay. Now, the first time I saw this, it was just presented as a recipe and it just works, right? But it took me a, kind of a little bit of digging to figure out why does this actually work. And here's a, an explanation that I really enjoy. It's not exactly a proof, but hopefully it gives the intuition. So if you go back, this is kind of a just toy diagram of what I've been drawing all along. You have like this density corresponding to the alternatives, the density corresponding to the null. This pi zero is the height. A, a, a threshold, or like kind of a rule for rejecting hypothesis is just kind of setting a threshold along this x-axis, right? Like I could decide to reject all the hypothesis with p-value below this number, I could decide to reject hypothesis below this number. What's the difference between those different thresholds? Well, if you have a threshold out here, actually I'll just draw this one. So, um, if you have a threshold over here, you think that there's going to be very few false positives very few fossil structures. The intuition is that you have a lot more of this red density relative to the blue density. Versus if you increase the threshold, you're going to have the relative density a lot more of the blue compared to the red. So your estimated false discovery rate is increasing as I increase the threshold. You can make this more precise by using this formula. So what the, the denominator is just kind of the total number of histo uh, total number of hypotheses below that threshold. Just look at the area of the histogram up to that point. The numerator we need it to be an estimate of the false positives. How can you estimate the number of false positives? You think about what is this, the area of this this uh, little blue rectangle. Well, the threshold is t. This is the the width of the rectangle. The height is pi zero. It's the so that's the pi zero times t. But then that's only the density. We actually want the number of false positives, and we have m total hypothesis. So just multiply by, by m, that gives you an estimate of the number of false positives. And as you vary t, you're just varying this x axis. Okay. And then at that point, the Benjamin Hockley procedure is motivated by this kind of optimization. You want to maximize the number of rejections, or in this case, just try to maximize the threshold as much as you can while controlling the false discovery rate. Okay. And then, if you just use this kind of picture, it actually gives you the thresholds from the Benjamin Hawker procedure. All you do is you set the threshold equal to that ith order p value, you substitute it into the formula that you have. So the number of rejections is i because we're rejecting the left i. And then you use the fact that the portion of nulls has to be less than one. So that gives you another. So this is not exactly the proof, but it gives, I think, the key idea behind it, the proof that I like at least. Okay. 
some questions about this? This is just going to be awkward with some explanation. Okay. So, first kind of vignette. How can you improve power by using contextual information? The reason I picked this picture is imagine that all the stars are like different hypotheses, and you can divide the sky into different regions. And someone has told you that this kind of blue region, this is where you really should be looking. There's kind of more alternatives, there's more signal out in this blue region. If you focus your multiple testing effort on that blue region, you're going to be able to get better power while still controlling the process. How do we formalize this a little bit more? Okay, or so, first of all, in genomics, where does this actually come up? You have some prior literature, you already know how to group hypothesis in some way. Uh, an example I like is, imagine that you have all the genes, a uh, different number of reads aligned to, each, um, aligned to each gene. Maybe these two genes, they both are actually nominal. They both have a difference between treatment and control. But then one of the genes has many more reads aligned to it than the other. You probably will have stronger, you'll be able to, you'll be able to sense difference in the one with lots of reads, uh, you'll have a better chance of detecting any difference there, even if it's a very small difference, just because you have a lot more reads aligned to it. Versus if you have very few reads aligned to this gene, you're going to have trouble detecting that many differences, even if there is one. Right, so you're better investing your hypothesis testing budget on those which are, which are easier to detect, which are the ones which have more reads aligned. So, uh, the main idea is there are often situations where you can don't just treat all the hypotheses identically, try to use context to focus the problem. Okay, and one kind of very concrete example we'll look in some depth. Imagine you're trying to test associations between different SNPs and histone markers. So this is something we will actually do. Each of these purple are SNPs. Uh, who are histone markers, you're testing whether there's any correlation at all. And kind of a natural assumption is that you're, you're usually going to have variants associated with histone markers that are nearby. This is not, you don't want to restrict your attention only to those that are nearby. That would be a little bit too aggressive. But you want to say, it's probably you're enriched for non-nulls if you're searching for the edges which are close to the variant of interest versus like a very long range connection. It's possible, but that's not. So if you think about the p-value histograms, remember I said that if you have a very long peak, that means you're enriched for non nulls right? So you imagine among the nearby ones, you should have a larger peak for the non -nulls. Among those which are further away, you have a smaller peak. Okay. So, how do you modify the procedure that we just described? The main idea is you separate your hypothesis into those separate groups. And instead of using the same threshold for all the groups, you use different thresholds for each group. So this notation, I'm introducing this bold T is the collection of all the thresholds for each of the groups. So in this case, you'd have three thresholds, one for each group. And now, instead of choosing one across all, you're allowed to choose thresholds so that you know, each group is going to have a different threshold. And we again estimate the false discovery rate. Right? It's the same kind of formula as above, except I'm multiplying by the number of hypotheses for each group. And I'm summing over the discoveries in each group. The problem is the same. You're still trying to maximize the number of rejections subject to some false discovery rate control. Here's a little simulation. So I just generate some data to play around with this idea. The main point is I generated, um, uh, I generated this kind of relationship matrix between SNPs and the stone markers, or like SNPs, right? Um, and the point is there are lots of associations along the diagonal, so short range, you have associations, Long range, it could happen, but it's not as likely. <coughs> and from there, I mean, I just generated the SNPs as binary data, Bernoulli, and YI is a some regression, where not going to be any association for the zeros in this matrix, but there is going to be association if you have like a red point. Okay, that 
drawing I showed you, it isn't just some cartoon hypothetical thing. In this simulation, it really does show up. If you divide into the short range and the long range connection, you do see some, like a, a lot more enrichment on the short range. And I also wanted to show, it's just a few lines of code. That's why I'm thinking of these as vignettes that you can extend to more complex research. Right? It's, you, know, you can go to the link and I have the entire example. But the first step, I'm just counting how many hypotheses in each group. The second step, I'm counting how many rejections in each group. And then finally, I just plug into that formula. So this was the, uh, it's the numerator in the formula and then the denominator in the formula. That's just what this is. So very, this is very straightforward to me. And at this point, I'm actually, I can just calculate an estimate of the false discovery rate for any combination of thresholds. So remember, here, you get different thresholds for each of the groups, <coughs> right? So I can set a threshold really high here and really low here, vice versa. You have a lot more flexibility in treating thresholds. So what I'm showing in this picture, I just evaluated a whole bunch of combinations of thresholds and estimated that false discovery rate for each of those combinations. The area in the red, these are where my estimated false discovery rate is below 0.1. Area which is blue, these are false discovery rate is higher than that. And the thing that's really interesting here is that you can increase the threshold for the first group. The first group, these are the links that are really close to one another. And you don't really increase the false discovery rate that much. While if you increase the threshold on the second group, even a little bit, your false discovery rate starts lowering. So this is where that flexibility comes in handy. Right? You're, it's telling you that you should focus most of your attention on you know, having as high a threshold on the first group and not really bothering trying to increase the threshold on the second group. Because if you increase the threshold on the second group even a little bit, your false discovery rate gets higher. Okay, technically, we could pick any threshold out here. They would all control the false discovery rate. Which thresholds should we actually use? Well, you just calculate the number of rejections at each location. Right? And here I've colored it in by the number of rejections. And kind of along this line of 0.1 false discovery rate, the one which had the largest number of rejections is way out at this end. So you're just investing all the energy, or all the budget on that first group, nearby group. So it's a toy example, and I hope it illustrates the idea of you know, looking at all pairs of hypotheses. That's a huge number of hypotheses. If you don't do anything, if you don't use any context, you're going to have very low power. Because you're going to have to consider everything in the second group as well. But if you're able to focus on the more promising ones, you can increase power. In reality, you wouldn't evaluate every single combination of thresholds. You would solve an optimization problem to choose the threshold. But it turns out you can formulate this as a complex optimization. And there's an important subtlety is that I've chosen the thresholds by looking at the data. And this is, this is tricky. This is not OK, actually, because the p-values must be independent from the thresholds. This is the, uh, the kind of where does the selection come in to selective inference is I've looked at the data to do some sort of selection to choose my threshold. And then I'm doing inference after. So that's where the, the word selective inference comes from. So you need to be clever about how you split the hypothesis so that you maintain the but this is you know, actually not that hard given the optimization that we've been We just kind of split the data and do the optimization for the subgroups. So that's the first vignette. Any questions about the first vignette? Okay, so we're going to move to the second vignette. And you know, the, the running theme of this vignette is. Even if p-values are miscalibrated, or even if it's difficult to write down a, a really believable model for your data, you can still often use symmetry and uh, still maintain false discovery rate by a symmetry. That's why I choose a picture that's very symmetric. Okay. So again, a, a small toy example just to, to make ideas concrete. So imagine it's a two-groups model but I'm simulating from a negative binomial distribution. So 
this is the mean the mean dispersion parametrization for negative binomial. Uh, I'm just varying the means between the two, the disease and the problem. So we have M genes. I'm just testing whether for each gene you have a difference in these negative binomial means. This is just like one step more complicated than the usual Gaussian tube model. And I think it's a little bit more believable in a single cell or a microbiome. So, what I do with the, I, I simulated data from this negative binomial model. I pre process it using the EDGEAR package. It's a pretty common package. It's just doing some sort of normalization. So, TMM and log transform. So it's relatively standard. Yeah, I'm following this nice post. And then I just run t tests on that transformed simulated data. And if I just run t tests on that, I'm divided here's the actual signal. You can tell the signal, there's a very obvious spike. But there's something really bad about the null, is that this is not even close to you. Right? And all hypothesis testing, uh, you know, we always assume that the t values are uniform under the null. So if they're not uniform under the null, you're not going to be controlling any kind of process for Okay, so the, the main idea here is to try to construct some sort of summary statistic which satisfies you know, a weaker symmetry of requirements, and you'll still be able to control the process for uh, So I'm going to review one you know, more basic approach. Uh, Jessica Jimmy Lee is going to be giving talk later in the program, and she's written some really interesting papers that describe kind of building around this sort of concept. Okay, so the you know, first step is we're going to reformulate this hypothesis testing problem as a regression problem. So remember I have disease or not disease, or treatment control. I'm going to store that in this matrix, or this uh, vector y, which is just a binary vector. Uh, and I'm going to store all my expression values in this n by n matrix, so samples by gene matrix. And you can imagine just running the regression, x beta plus plus. And kind of the null that we're going to be, like the equivalent of the null in this regression model is that beta j is 0. There's a little bit of subtlety. Like one is a marginal test. Here, this is actually conditional on the rest. But we'll still be able to have kind of similar interpretation and we will work out with this one. So y, x, beta, most of these genes, there's no association, the expression level and the outcome. Some of them there is. Okay, and there's an idea called mirror statistics. And the main idea of these mirror statistics is to split your data and look for consistency between the splits. So this notation, I've taken my big matrix x, I split it in half, random rows, same with y. And I'm going to calculate this sort of statistic. What does the statistic, how do you interpret it? Let's parse it. So we're looking at gene n. This part is the easiest to understand. This is like the magnitude of the coefficient for gene n on the two different splits. Okay, so you imagine if both of them, you could imagine just f is like the sum, this is like the total magnitude, like the average magnitude of the effects for gene n. The first part is a more interesting one. This is measuring the consistency between the two different estimates. Right? So if they're both positive effects or they're both negative effects, then the sign is positive. But then if there's disagreement between the two splits, then the sign is negative. So this is a really useful, this is really useful information. Right? If there's really an effect, you would expect some sort of consistency. Graphically, I would think about it this way. And here I'm just, just use the sign. So I split the data into two pieces randomly. If there's really an effect, it's actually not null. You expect the same sign. Uh, if it's a strong effect, you expect a larger slope. If it's no effect, then sometimes the signs will be dis disagreeing. Again, this is something you can do in just a few lines of code. Randomly split the data, fit models on each split, and then measure the agreement between the coefficients. This actually comes from all the figures I'm going to show below. It uses this one. OK. If you just plot, oh, question. Is it that, is it 
Um, it's a pretty general procedure, actually. The main assumptions you have to make are about the distribution of beta hat. So if you're, um, yeah, if you're working with different y's, you might have to have a different estimator with that satisfies those assumptions. Other questions? Okay. So okay, so this was the the histogram of that test statistic in that negative binomial problem, the one that we know is miscalculated that we're trying to fix. Right? Now, how should we reject? Okay, so kind of give it away already. Right? Definitely anything that's negative, we don't want to, re to reject. Right? Because if it's a negative sign, then that means the two splits didn't agree with one another. Right? So we know we should definitely be only really considering the positive sign as, as statistics. Right? But you know, if we're really, really large ones, then you know, that, then you definitely, you're finding real effects because you have large beta, like the magnitude is large, and they agree inside. But it's possible, you might get into this region where they're consistent with one another, but then their small effects, they, they're probably just noise, right? So how can you choose a threshold? You, know, you never really see the colors, you only ever see this. How can you choose a threshold going down so that you can control the false discovery rate? That's the point. The main intuition comes from, you know, in the case that you do have information about the color, what would you do? Well, uh, false discovery rate. <coughs> okay. The denominator is obvious. The, the idea is, you know, the number of rejections is just how many are above your threshold. Right? And you can easily count that. You don't need to know whether it's null or not null. But how are you going to estimate the number of false discoveries? What you really wish you had is the proportion of blue here. Let me see it better here. Like, if I were going to use 0.01 as my threshold, I'd love to know the number of blue that are above 0.01. Right? But you never know exactly the number that are above 0.01. But what you do know is, if you're willing to make a symmetry assumption on this blue histogram, then you would map the 0.01 here to the minus 0.01, and look at the area below minus 0.01. And if this is, the tails are really symmetric, then this is a pretty good estimate of the number of false positives. So you're gonna use this below, uh, you're gonna use the below negative t as a proxy for the number of false positives. And this turns out to be a good estimate of the false discovery rate if you're willing to make a symmetry assumption. Okay, and at this point, it turns into the same kind of optimization problem as before. Yeah, uh, same optimization problem as before, and you can control the false discovery rate. So subtlety, anything where you're splitting the data, you're going to lose it. There's a bit of work, and the references I'm giving explain some ways that you can try repeating this procedure many times, and you can increase, you can almost recover the power as if you had had uh, using all the samples in your original estimation. Okay. So if you're interested in this, I have some backup slides at the very end, discuss that aggregation procedure. And just in the code example I'll show, this does control the false discovery rate. Power is, of course, a little bit reduced, but that's expected. Uh, if you use ordinary Benjamin Hochberg, it's going to be inflated because of the miscalculation. And, and just a final teaser, uh, this is from one of my projects. Uh, and this is kind of the reason I wanted to present on this topic in the first place is because uh, I found it very useful for studying microbiome interventions. So a common problem in microbiome studies is you track people over time, you give them maybe an antibiotic intervention, a diet intervention, some sort of uh, change, and you want to see which species are, are affected by it. Standard testing procedures are not going to be so good about this, partly because they're delayed effects, and also because Samples are correlated over time, so the usual independence assumption for testing or t-test is not going to hold. But we were able to construct a new kind of mirror statistic based on just the same kind of idea that works in this temporal setting. And this is just showing we were able to pull out some species where there's a very clear effect before and after the intervention. Okay, so that's it. Um, Kind of the main takeaways I want to have is 
even though these have been really small vignettes, I think the main abstractions that they describe are pretty generally applicable, and you'll I hopefully see them in different papers going forward. So the first abstraction, seeing Benjamin Hochberg as a kind of optimization problem rather than as just a recipe, I think that gets you pretty far because it allows you to tie in context very naturally. And then the second idea is anytime you do data splitting, uh, you can start trying to see what is a, a good kind of symmetry assumption that you have. And then that can allow you to get the control of something like that. And finally, even though I've been presenting everything in a standard multiple hypothesis testing setup, a lot of these ideas come up in other areas of computational mechanics. There are some interesting papers doing this in experimental design and unsupervised learning. So I've included some references. You'll notice the same kind of abstractions as you do those references. Okay, so thank you very much.